The Reserve Bank of India's move on capital control has led to a debate whether India is walking back to 1980s era of pre-liberalization. To understand how does it impact the India Inc's M&A ability and the India story as a whole, we are now joined by Sanjeev Dhuna, partner at Allen & Overy from London and someone who closely watches the emerging markets. Sanjeev, thank you so much for joining us here at the courtroom. Let me first uh, get your preliminary views as to how RBI curbs will impact Indian companies' acquisition plans. Your views on that first. Thank you. Uh, well, I think it's clear to say that the regulations are going to dampen the acquisition activity of Indian companies. We've seen in the recent uh, past a number of uh, large Indian conglomerates have said that India Inc. needs to grow internationally. It needs to be more than just a domestic player. It needs to be an international heavyweight. The way in which this can happen is through acquisitions outside of India that creates size and scale quickly. So if you take, for example, the Bathi acquisition of Zane, uh, that, that, that acquisition allowed Bathi to uh, export into Africa very, very quickly. Now, the regulations will stop that from happening. Uh, whether these regulations are a temporary measure and whether they are clarified as to how the limits will apply going forward remains to be seen. Well, Sanjeev, some believe that Indian large corporate may not be much impacted as these curbs will not necessarily limit their ability for acquisition. Uh, but domestic challenges is what will restrict them for this global play. What do you have to say to that? India has a good story to tell in terms of its ability to grow outside of India. The question now is for some of the, let's say, some of the smaller growing companies, the mid-tier companies, that want to attain the sort of status and growth of, say, a Tata or an S or a Vedanta. How will these companies do that now in light of the restrictions and limits placed upon it? Uh, the issue really is this. Uh, at the moment, there is not a level playing field for Indian companies to go and acquire outside of India, so that they're at a competitive disadvantage in terms of the global M&A map. What really remains to be seen is how those companies can now seek consent on, an, on a case-by-case -case basis uh, by asking the RBI to give them some freedom to make these acquisitions. Uh, the reality of the situation is that in an M&A process, it's very hard for a company to be taken seriously if it has to go and get domestic consents in order to make those acquisition, acquisitions. So, you know, from, from the word go, those companies are going to be at a disadvantage compared to their competition when it comes to international growth. Well, again, in your uh, interaction with your clients, uh, is India being looked with more concern uh, as, a, as a market that you're more concerned uh, to invest in vis-a-vis uh, -vis other uh, com countries, be it China, Indonesia, and so on and so forth? If you look at the changes that have come in, there is a view in the market that this is turning the clock back a couple of decades in terms of liberalization. And I think what investors are going to be concerned about is that rather than addressing the causes for why the rupee is weak, these measures are really only addressing the symptoms. And really what's needed to protect the rupee is further liberalization and reform. So investors have the confidence that India is on the path of free trade, that India is going to allow investment to grow, allow companies to grow within, within the idea of you know, being an entrepreneur. I, I think you know, when you compare, say, the U.S. Treasuries and the yields that you're getting now in, in places like the U.S. to the emerging market uh, yields on debt, investors are looking seriously in terms of whether the risk and return in terms of investing in, say, India and other growth markets justifies their, their risk appetite compared to, say, the U.S. So I think that there is going to be consequences in terms of investor appetite, particularly around the, um, the, the, the sentiment towards liberalization and whether India is going to be committed to that in a long-term fashion. How's the India story uh, being looked into now, uh, Sanjeev? Tell us your views on that. I think, I think the shine has come off the India story, um, and I think these measures only confirm that sentiment. 
uh, my own view, and it is just my view, is that really we need to have more measures which show a liberalized attitude to the market, which allows capital to come into India, allows capital to come out of India. I think all of the growth opportunities in all markets, in all of the markets, have uh, a rocky road. There's always going to be obstacles. There's always going to be some unknown issue that you need to deal with. What investors really grapple with and what, where, where they become really unstuck is where there is real uncertainty around the policy direction of, of a particular country. And I think that's where India needs to focus its attention because if it is demonstrating its willingness to reform, that will provide a lot of confidence to investors to come back to India. If, however, there are mixed messages to the market around whether they are pro liberalization or want to adopt currency controls, then that's, that, that leaves investors in a state of uncertainty. And with uncertainty, people will not take any bold decisions to invest. Well, thank you, Sanjeev, for coming by and sharing your perspective. Indeed, India is going through some tough times and some tough challenges ahead of us. Time to slip into a short break, but on the other side, the promoters will have to pay 20% capital gains tax on the sale of shares in an IPO. More on that when we return.